Would you be tempted to stare down the barrel of a loaded 12-gauge shotgun set to go off sometime in the next 100 years? In 1982, people lined up for what had been called an art exhibit to do just that. It's time to join your guide, Jim Ayer, for an exciting 12-episode journey into remodeling your life. You're going to discover that God's transforming power is real, and He's ready to provide that power to you. Now here's your guide, Jim Ayer, to take you on the journey of a lifetime, an amazing and dynamic experience with God. Staring down the barrel of a loaded gun is not my idea of fun, but it seems that many people disagree with me. Why are people tempted to gamble with their lives? The human race is drawn to temptation like a moth is to flame. The actual gun in the art exhibit was loaded and set to fire a fatal blast sometime within a hundred years from when the clock was set. I'll bet you that not a single person sitting in front of that deadly barrel thought the gun would fire while they were in the chair. But you can rest assured that when you toy with danger, the devil will always pull the trigger. When we mess around with temptation, we will get hurt. But the good news is, you and I don't need to get hooked by temptation any longer. As the old country saying goes, I was knee-high to a grasshopper when I started fishing. Well, growing up fishing served two purposes, actually. It put food on the table, and it was just loads of fun to fish with Dad. I had the opportunity to fish from Central America to Alaska. Which brings up another country saying, the worst day of fishing is better than the best day of working. Fishing is one of the oldest professions and pastimes of the human race. Preparing to go fishing can be as easy as having a stick, some line, and a hook with a worm on the end of it. Why, in some countries, they don't even use the stick. If it's a commercial venture, it could cost millions to stock the boats and prepare for a day on the ocean. One key ingredient is the bait. I've used flies, lures, eggs, well, different kinds of bait, and the list actually goes on. You see, fishing is a real art. If you're fly fishing, you catch what bugs are out, and you select a fly that looks just like the bugs that are near the water on that day. Then, after studying the stream, you determine the location where the fish will be, and you place your fly in the perfect spot to just guide it right past the nose of that unsuspecting fish. No matter what type of bait or set up the fishermen may use, they're all designed to do one thing, tempt the fish to bite on a concealed hook. This is exactly what the devil's doing when he dangles temptation in front of you. He's trying to lure you, to attract you, to seduce you, to bite on a hidden hook. And make no mistake, there are always hidden hooks ready to slice deep into your flesh. But just like the fish in the stream, you don't need to bite regardless of how tempting the meal is flowing past you may be. Because of the devil's alarming success rate at fishing for sin, we've been duped into the belief that simply seeing a wiggling worm must be sin. In other words, many Christians believe that temptation itself is sin. Do you think that's true? Well, even if you don't believe it, I would venture to say that you probably act like you do anyway. I'm convinced that if the devil could keep only one truth from you, this would be it. Temptation is not sin, and God has the power to keep you from surrendering to it, from biting on it. It is a complete lie that you must accept this biblical fact that falling for every temptation is unavoidable. You and I have been held captive to this lie far too long. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says, when Jesus lived on earth, he was very tempted in every way. He was tempted in the same ways we are tempted, but never sinned. Our Lord came to show us how to walk the walk and provide all the power to do so. There is no pressure to sin that is greater than the power of Almighty God to deliver you from it. Just to make it very clear one last time, fishing's called fishing and not catching because it depends on whether the fish decide to bite the bait. As a fisherman, I don't stand in the water grabbing fish and manually hooking them up. It is the same with the devil and you. He can dangle all the tempting bait he wants in front of you, 
but you don't need to bite. According to Ellen White, through belief in Satan's misrepresentations of God, man's character and destiny were changed. But if men will believe in the Word of God, they will be transformed in mind and character and fitted for eternal life. God's Word says that the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. By way of example, I want to address a temptation that is so sensitive that most people don't even want to discuss it. Biting on this temptation has destroyed multitudes of marriages and it's wrecked entire families. It has infiltrated every level of our society, including the church, because the devil makes sure that it rarely stops with just a look. In some cases, it has led to the most terrible of crimes. What is this temptation? It's pornography. The devil dangles sex in front of us at every opportunity. At the supermarket checkout counter, portrayed by scantily clad women on magazine covers. On television, on our computers, even in public today, sometimes even in the church, exhibited in the way men and women dress. The devil is dangling his bait at every corner. I want you to meet Larry. Larry's not his real name and he has requested that we do not show his face nor reveal his true voice due to the sensitive nature of his past addiction. I mean, Jimmy asked um, what the effects of pornography was on my life and my family or others around me. Um, I guess the biggest thing, let's talk about younger age first, uh, was that um, I drafted my younger siblings into it. Um, I, I really haven't talked much about it. I tried to, you know, there's this point in your life, I guess, when you're younger, you're 15, 16, where you go your separate ways, and you try to pretend those things didn't happen in your younger life. I have only approached one of my siblings to, to really discuss it and um, basically ask for forgiveness um, since I led them into this. Um, the other one doesn't want to talk about it, has so eh, I don't, don't want to even discuss it, so uh, that we've left it at that. But it, at least in the teens, early 20s, and those years, it, it definitely made a rift in our family, uh, at least as far as my siblings are concerned. I realized more and more how, how much this was affecting my relationship with God. Um, not that I didn't realize that before, but the cycle had, it just had eaten holes in my life, and enough is enough. And I was at a low point, probably about a year, year and a half ago, year, whatever. And Lord has a way of reaching people when they're low points. In fact, I, I, I'm a sincere believer that he pushes us there sometimes, allows things to happen that will refocus our, our lives. And about that time, um, I received a uh, manuscript from a good friend. Uh, that, that manuscript uh, turned out to uh, be the what was now, or what was now known as the book uh, Transformation. Um, and it did transform me, and I'm, I'm a big push here behind Jim trying to get this thing out. It, it, it changed my life. It, it brought me into a much deeper relationship with God and the Bible. Uh, my daily worship schedule was iffy, to say the least. Uh, my prayer time was, uh, was there, but it, it, my prayers never went further than the introduction of his chapter or book where he talks about prayers not going through the ceiling. That's how I felt. Uh, they never made it through the ceiling. Um, I was sure God loved me. I never had any qualms all my life in that area. It was just my relationship with God was that fault, and I didn't know how to get it back on track. I think Benjamin Franklin put his finger on the problem with temptation when he said, what makes resisting temptation difficult for many people is that they don't want to discourage it completely. Could that be what happens with you and me? Many times we make the conscious choice to open the door of temptation just a tiny bit. We're scared to close the door completely, even though leaving the door open will result in our destruction. Satan's sole focus is to destroy every hint of Christ in you, which is why he's in the business of tempting you. But when you're faced with what seems like an overwhelming urge to sin, you have an out. God dwelling in you. Therefore, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, the Bible says, and he will flee from you. You see, God can do anything he wants to do because after all, he's God. And when he's living in you, 
why he wants to keep you from sinning. Remember the angel told Mary to call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Here's the key. Your prayers and mine will be far more effective in the battle with evil if we start by surrendering all to God, not just 99%, but all. <laughs> we need to completely close the door to temptation and lock it. The devil does not own bolt cutters. And contrary to what Satan was like us to believe, temptation is not sin. Don't miss this. The first look is not sin. But we must turn away from the second look. This is critical. At the moment of recognition, call out to God and he will give you the power to turn away, to keep you from sinning. <laughs> this is not just wishful thinking. It's Bible truth. Just as falling out of a tree results in gravity pulling you down to the ground, well then, resisting the devil will result in him bolting from the scene when we appeal to our best friend Jesus Christ in prayer. At that moment, it becomes God's battle. <laughs> and it's, well, when you appear to, to be overwhelmed, you're fighting against all odds, those things will soon evaporate and leave an empty battlefield when you call upon Jesus Christ. Ever wonder why your life doesn't reflect the powerful change that's supposed to be part of every Christian experience? Do temptations weigh on you and leave you saying, maybe I'm not trying hard enough or wondering if God's holding up his end of the deal? Could there be some secret everyone but you knows? Well, there is a well-kept secret and few Christians know about it or talk about it until now. Transformation may be the most exciting and life-changing book you will ever read. It's not only upbeat and easy to read, but powerful in its message, the message of transformation. Jim Eyre exposes plans that have successfully kept the truth from Christians for decades, truth that will allow you to become the happiest Christian imaginable. Don't miss out. Order Transformation today by calling 800-876-7313 or log on to transformationinfo.com. This is perhaps one of the greatest books ever written on the biblical teachings of Christ. Jesus used parables to open the vistas of heaven to the people and to expand their thinking. As no other book has ever done, Ellen White unwraps the parables, allowing us to see Christ our salvation revealed in all of his beauty and splendor throughout each and every page. Order your copy today by calling 800-876-7313 or logging on to transformationinfo.com. Even better than resisting temptation once you're confronted with it is to do all you can to avoid it. If you're once a smoker or an alcoholic, you certainly would not choose to hang out at the bars or the liquor store. If you're a drug dealer like I was, you wouldn't hang out around the pot shops that sell the stuff. Temptations are always there. Um, in fact, I shared with Jim that uh, it's been about a year and I, I fell a few weeks back. It was. It was not a joyous experience. Um, and with the Lord's help, I'll never fail again. But I can honestly say that I haven't, since my teen years, I have not gone a, a year without indulging in these, these addictions. Um, will I uh, be tempted? Probably the rest of my life. Um, Satan knows everybody's weaknesses, and he learned this weakness on me a long time ago. He will probably continue to tempt me. I know now that and I did know before, I just didn't want to accept that knowledge or acknowledge it. <clears throat> I know that with God's help, I can beat this addiction. Um, when I feel an urge that, hey, I need to something to feed an addiction, I turn the other way. I, I used to, um, should we say, uh, stare at uh, uh, ladies uh, that I found attractive. I don't do that anymore. So I've got my own wife. I don't need another lady, wife to look at. What are you looking for anyway? I know there's a higher power I'm responsible to. This higher power made me, created me, and, and gave me a will to make choices to accept him and to be a friend of his. The first thing I would say is acknowledge that you, are, you have an addiction. Um, that's probably the first thing in any step or to recovery is to acknowledge there is a problem. The second is to seek, uh, obviously, God's help. 
confess your sin to the Lord, let him know that you're sorry and you want to make a change. And uh, I think he's put people here on earth to, to, uh, to help us in these things. Uh, seek out a friend, somebody you can be accountable for and make that friend accountable, ask you questions um, to check in on you. And uh, it's gotta be somebody you trust and it will hold your confidentiality. But to make yourself accountable to a spouse, to a friend, um, there's nothing like that for peer pressure, if you want to use the word. It, um, it's somebody tangible right here. Not to say that God isn't tangible, but God has a small voice. A friend can be pretty pretty pesky right in front of you, and it's, it's hard to tell them to their face that you've done something that they, they've been encouraging you for a while not to do. I'm a firm believer that you can't just throw something out. Uh, the Bible's pretty clear that when we sweep a room clean in our mind, and if we don't fill it with something else, the devil's gonna move right in. And I'd been down that road many times before. Um, I don't know how many times I had given up this addiction. And, uh, and that would last about two weeks at the most. And um, we were back to, and it's, it's worse than the time before. That is the, that's the sorry state of sin. You, know, you think you got it cleaned up, and the next time around, it's worse and worse and worse. No, this time we gotta fill it with something. The book of James says, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Moses had all the riches of Egypt at his disposal. He was in line to become Pharaoh, but he decided to turn away from all of it because he realized that it would cost him his eternal position of royalty in the courts above. The same royal courts you and I are destined to live in and reign for eternity. You know, we tend to exercise our physical bodies so we can build muscle. We tend to go to the gym, the track, all these places to exercise those muscles. But what do we do about our spiritual muscles? You know, it's easier to resist temptation when we exercise our spiritual muscles as well. The more we exercise our power of choice for good, well, it's easier to resist temptation. See, that's our part in the plan of salvation, the choosing, the, the turning from evil. When we do that, the stronger we become in Jesus Christ. Since 1849, the Review and Herald Publishing Association has produced the best of Christian literature, helping guide people around the world into a closer walk with Jesus Christ. And they continue to be committed to bringing you the very best, helping you fall more deeply in love with your Lord. That's why they partnered with Jim Air to place transformation into the hands of every Christian. There's no doubt that your heart and mind will be thrilled as you read Transformation and ponder life's choices in the weekly study guide and spend quality time with family, friends, or your church group viewing this exciting 12-episode DVD series. You owe it to yourself and to those you love, Transformation. Call us today to purchase the book, study guide, the DVD series, or all three at a package price. Call 800-876-7313 or log on to transformationinfo.com. Jim was a drug dealer, an alcoholic, and a thief until God called him. But that was just the beginning. As someone said, he has lived six lifetimes. He became wealthy, lobbied on Capitol Hill, and was a church leader. But he was lost until God gave him a second chance. People tell us when you start reading Second Chance, you can't put it down. Your loved ones who may be wondering if God will give them a second chance will love it too. Now here's the information you need. Call us or visit us online. This is the key. God allows us to exercise free will. We can select the road to oblivion, which is succumbing to temptation. It's very wide, nicely paved, and gradually descends to destruction. There are times when on this road you would never have a clue that the road ends in complete annihilation. C.S. Lewis once wrote, and I quote, Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts, end quote. We must understand that when speaking of temptation, a true Christian cannot use the excuse that the devil made me do it. 
God has given every human free choice. That's why we're here in this messed up world in the first place. Because our first parents, Adam and Eve, bit on the devil's temptation. That's why Jesus came to provide an alternative to continually falling for every temptation that comes our way. As soon as he was baptized, the Holy Spirit led him to the desert to do battle with Satan and show us the way. But don't miss this. The first item of preparation for the battle was to spend 40 days in prayer. Perhaps it was the touch of a supernatural being that brought him out of his 40 days of communion with the Father. When he looked up, there was this dazzling being who said, I've come to warn you about one. Well, as a matter of fact, you look like the one. If you're really who you say you are, the savior of the world, here, take, take this stone and turn it to bread. Well, for Jesus, it was a temptation. He was the God of the universe, incarnate in human form. He looked at it though and he said, no, no, no. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now temptation number two. The devil takes him up to a high temple and he says, if you're really the son of God, cast yourself down. And Jesus quotes scripture. Now the devil pulls his mask away, takes him up to the highest mountaintop, shows him all the glories of planet earth. He says, I got it from Adam. It's mine. I claim it is mine. But if you bow down and worship me as your Lord, I'll give it all to you all the riches of planet Earth. And Jesus says, Satan, get behind me now. It's full blown. He says, no, no, no. I want none of your temptations. My friends, temptation does not have to be something that we bite on. Jesus provided the way to get us past temptation. We no longer have to succumb to temptation. So let's bring these temptations of Jesus down to our day. The first was lust of the flesh. That's food and drugs and alcohol fit in this category, along with many other consumable items. It's evident in our world that this is a major area of temptation. It was part of the temptation that hooked Eve. Abuse of the natural appetite was also the first temptation that the devil tried to hook Jesus with when he said, turn these stones to bread. The lust of the eyes is actually number two. After Eve fell, she ran to Adam as the devil's temptress. Adam saw what she had done and knew that the penalty for her disobedience was death. He looked upon her beauty and he desired the woman more than he desired God. So he took of the fruit and he ate it. And the final one is the pride of life. So many things fit into this category, but we'll focus on the power, the fame, and the wealth. None of these things are sins in and of themselves, but power, fame, and wealth are easily abused by those who aren't humble before God and they can become idols to those who seek after them before they seek after God. Satan tempted Eve with his power and she desired to have it. Her pride of life won out over her love for God. Jesus gained the victory just as we must gain it. He laid aside every bit of himself and instead of relied upon the Father's power to overcome. He defeated the devil on every level of temptation and he did it for you and for me in the same way that we must do it by relying upon the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. In order for us to be victorious Christians, avoiding falling for temptation, we must choose to tap into that mighty power that Jesus offers you and me today. You know, Jesus had asked the disciples to get in the boat and go to the other side, that some way, somehow he would meet them there. Well, as they're rowing in the middle of the night, the waves are getting bigger and bigger, and they're quite huge, and the disciples are getting a little nervous about this. And all of a sudden, they see this form walking across the water, and they think, who is this? Is this a bad omen? Is this an omen that we're going to die? And then all of a sudden, they finally see that, well, maybe it's Jesus. And Peter said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to get out of the boat. Oh, tell me to get out of the boat. And the Lord says, sure, come on, Peter. Come on, get out of the boat. So Peter steps out, he gets on the top of the water while he's walking just like it's cement. He walks across toward Jesus, but then he does an interesting thing. He turns back to look at the rest of the disciples, kind of like, hey, check me out, huh? Look what I'm doing. And about that time, a big old wave comes up between Jesus and Peter. And Peter turns back and looks, he can't see Christ, and he sinks like a rock, man. I mean, he's gone. His eyes are off of Jesus. Don't miss this part. His eyes are off of Jesus. He begins sinking like a rock. And immediately Peter cries out, Lord, save me. And Jesus is right there. 
picks him up by the hand and the next thing they're in the boat and they're all the way to the shore. It's amazing the power of God. You know, I admit it, I'd always given Peter a bad time about his failures until one day I thought, forget the storm. Would I have even gotten out of the boat, even in calm conditions? Well, it's true that Peter received a mild rebuke from the Lord, but it wasn't because he didn't trust Jesus when he got out of the boat. When he got out of the boat, he had faith that Jesus could take him the distance. It was only on the way that Peter began having the troubles. You know, the Lord says, interesting thing here, the Lord says, go and sin no more. Are you really going to get out of the boat of sin because, you know, you, you believe Jesus, you believe in him? Or are you going to stay in the boat with the rest of the crowd and never test his mighty power to, to save you from sin? I think it's interesting that the Bible doesn't tell us how Peter got back in the boat. <laughs> what do you think? You know, did, did he uh, walk back? What, what really happened? Well, I, I like to think that the Lord, when he picked him up, he walked arm in arm all the way back to the boat. With the power and strength of Jesus, he became a water walker. You know, we, we think about these things, we wonder about these things, and we try and deal with the storms in our life, the things that are happening. But with God alongside of us, we become water walkers. We're, we can learn how to become water walkers with Christ. You know, this is, where, this is where our strength from temptation originates. Remember, it's from temptation. That's where it all originates is in Him. What He wants to do in and through you to, to make you an overcomer. It, it, it's mind boggling, but in order to walk on the water, you need to choose to get out of the boat. It, it's basically that simple. As you go arm in arm with Jesus, you can walk anywhere God wants you to walk. When he told the paralytic and the prostitute to sin no more, he was saying, hey, don't lose sight of me. Don't let go of my arm and I will lead you to victory. That's what he was telling. Remember, as you cooperate with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. If you want to walk on water, you need to trust Jesus and actually get out of the boat. Either you trust that as the creator, God of the universe, he's able to keep you above the waves of life, or you don't. If you don't trust him, you will lose out on an unbelievable experience, walking on water. The reality of the situation is that there's no need to sink beneath the waves of temptation that beat against you every moment of every day. Call out to God right now. Ask him to turn you from the temptations that are plaguing you at this very moment. Plead for his strength. Look into his loving eyes and he will take you by the hand, lift you up, and arm in arm with God, you will become a water walker.